Hi everyone, I um, just want to welcome Jess, uh, who started Core Mentoring, which is pretty important, and has now travelled much of the world um, helping out at Core Sprints since starting Core Mentoring, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Andrea, who helped make Core, core um, yeah, Mentoring, yes, Core Mentoring scale. So she helped, her, helped Jess organise things to make it scale and she could get other people involved. So, welcome all. So, hi. How's everybody doing today? Good? Yeah? More, more, yeah. Right on. Yeah. 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 There we go. So, um, <coughs> as Brian was saying, uh, this is Jess, hi. and she's amazing. Uh, I'm XJM. Jess. XJM. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm Andrea, also known as uh, Zen Doodles, and I just started with the nerdery. So we, we're both kind of like, you know, doing a career change too right now, which is kind of exciting, but probably I'm not relevant. I'm going to be starting at Acquia the first week in March. So I'm not actually working for Acquia <coughs> yet. But we put it on the slide anyway, because it's really awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a very awesome thing, but. The, the tall guy with the spiky hair, that's my boss now, so. <laughs> So um, before we like you know really get into details about patch review, we were kind of wondering if uh, how many people have actually done uh, like submitted a patch on Drupal.org? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So so um, has anyone applied patches? Yeah. Is there anyone here who doesn't even know what a patch is? Anyone? Right on. Okay, so but essentially, you know, we know a patch is is a, a file that tells us which lines to remove and which lines to take out, right? <clears throat> and why do we need patches? Well, patches are how improvements are made. Some of, some of us will have recognized this uh, particular animation thing. So what happens is um, <clears throat> some user says, "Oh my God, I have this really horrible problem," and um, and you know, I'm, it makes me unhappy. And so uh, they go to the issue queue and they file a bug report. <clears throat> which, you know, is awesome and very helpful. But then Paula the programmer comes along and says, oh my God, I have this problem. Searches the issue queue, because that's what Paula does. And uh, says, oh, hey look, there's a bug report. <clears throat> I'll try to fix this, since it's not fixed yet. Um, uploads a patch, marks the issue as needs review. And then along comes Rachel the reviewer. Right um, now, uh, those of you who are familiar with this uh, this particular section uh, slide from from Webchick's uh, presentation, she used to be Tati on the tester. You can't see it at the bottom here, but that's what it's <clears throat> so Rachel, the reviewer, comes along and says, "Oh my word, what, what? <clears throat> I'll just post some feedback and let everybody know that this is confusing and, and doesn't work." So. Paula comes back and says, all right, thanks. Here's, you know, here's another try. Let me try again. Um, this poor soul, Wendy, is, is still on, um, you know, Windows XP. And so she has to post in and says, you know what, this breaks everything in IA6 because, you know, everything does. Also, um, mind your spelling. <clears throat> Marks the issue again as needs work. So who comes back? Paula, the programmer, and says, all right. <clears throat> Try this. Rachel the viewer comes in, has a look, much better. Mark's issue is reviewed and tested, and then there's a, a, a magic thing that happens where someone comes in and actually, um, hopefully, commits the code that was in the patch. So, uh, what kinds of patch reviews do we do in Drupal before things go in core? Does anybody have ideas on this? Anyone? There's the first, first thing that reviews the, the code, the patches. That's the bot, the test bot, the automated testing bot that comes in. And then there's a peer co-review. That's, uh, you know, Rachel the reviewer. She comes in, she reviews the code and says, you know, and that's kind of what this session is about. But I just, like, that was a spoiler, so don't ignore what I just said. <laughs> so Rachel review <laughs> reviews for accessibility, for performance, security, usability, and so on. Um, and then, of course, the, whoever's going to do the committing does another review toward the end. But not all of these are important. Right now, all we're going to talk about is, of course, peer code review. So why do we review code? We review code because um, <clears throat> we need to make sure that some coding standards are followed. We want to know that, um, 
that people who are submitting patches and people who are reviewing patches can, um, can uh, submit good patches in the future too, right? That's a, a good thing. So it's an education and mentoring opportunity. And then we also want to make sure that we have a quality end product. The coding standards that we review for will be security, maintainability, and um, documentation, among other things. Um, <clears throat> and then also, again, education. We want to mentor the next generation. We want to make sure that Paula the programmer can upload good patches so we have good code. And we'll make sure that Rachel the reviewer can learn a bunch of stuff too because it's, it's uh, a very good learning opportunity for that. And also, we want to make sure that Drupal still rocks, right? <clears throat> so what's important, you have to like, if I like keep going over where you're going to, where yeah, you That's fine. I, I can okay. like, I'll just, you know, grab you by the shoulders. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That works. Yeah. Okay, so what's important when, when reviewing? Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, the most important thing, this is my opinion, and obviously there are going to be people who uh, disagree, but, but is something that uh, just coined as full frontal nicety. That was you, right? It was, I think it was actually Angie who said it first. But it's, right. it's my thing. It's her thing. Uh, um, so we want to make sure that, that in the issue queue that we are that we're encouraging, um, especially new developers, but also uh, even even old developers. Well, when I say old, I mean not I'm old. Experienced okay. developers. Experienced developers, exactly. We want to make sure that we're encouraging ma mature, <laughs> experienced developers. Um, and, 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 when, um, and also the new developers. We want to support improvement, and, and we want to make sure that we ask questions if we have them. <clears throat> and, and I'm actually just going to sort of jump in here and say that I really think this is the singly most important part of a patch review, because this is your opportunity to reach out to someone. This might be the first time they've ever submitted a patch. It's your chance to build a relationship with someone. If they have a bad experience the first time, they're not going to come back. If you're rude, it's like, why would, why would I waste my time doing this? But if you're positive, then, then they learn something from you, you can learn something from them, and you've gotten to a point where it's, it's a positive experience, and so they'll come back and, and submit another patch in the future, so. Absolutely, which is why when, we, uh, when I talk about encouragement, um, when we talk about encouragement, uh, some of the important things we need to acknowledge that, that the, the coder who has submitted a patch has put some effort into this, right? They had to think about the problem. They had to define it. They had to consider a solution. They had to solve the problem. And then they also had to upload a patch. It, it's so much easier for people just to fix it in, in my environment and move along, right? Mm -hmm. So people have, have made a lot of effort to, uh, in order, when, when they, <clears throat> When they upload a patch, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that, and emotion. So, so we we need to make sure that we are being, we're, we're acknowledging their effort, we're showing gratitude for their effort. So, even if it is not code that we want to have in Drupal, we want to take the opportunity to acknowledge that they're that what they're doing is you know effort on their part, and be happy that they've done it. And then if it's not something that we want in Drupal, then we want to support improve, improvement. We want to give them pointers on what we, need to, what we need from them next time, right? So the next time they find a problem, or the next time they upload a new patch, right? Because remember that Paula had to upload three patches in that, that initial issue to, before she got something that was committed. Right? So we need, to, we need to be specific about what changes to make, and we need to provide links, if, uh, if there are them, to documentation that, that shows you know, why we do what we do and, and what the good things are about it. And uh, with regard to providing documentation, that's something you might not think about, but that's really important for that is, so once upon a time, I was reviewing this really cool patch that someone in this room submitted. And um, he had gotten a review from someone else who told him to do the wrong thing. And so there was a back and forth with two different people who were speaking authoritatively in this issue. One of them, me, telling him to do the right thing, and another person telling him to do the wrong thing. And that's got to be really frustrating. Now, if either of us at the first point had taken the time to look up the documentation and say, oh, right here it says this, and then put that link in the issue, that solves the question. You know, There's no doubt in anyone's mind in the future. And that also gets people thinking about, okay, well, I can look on this page in the handbook in the future if I, if I need to make a coding standards change, if I need to know more about how to write queries properly. It, that gets them in the mode of looking in the issue when they're creating patches in the future. So it's a chance for you to help programmers program for Drupal better. Oh, sorry. She's not wearing shoes. <clears throat> She's so, not wearing shoes. 
I'm, I'm not wearing shoes, sorry. Okay, so um, again, be specific, provide links to documentation when you can, and, and support improvement in any other way that you can. On IRC, you can, you can um, give pointers. Even sometimes, right, sometimes even just asking questions is supporting improvement, right? Because what you, what you do when you ask a question is you make that person think about you know, the reasons for things that maybe aren't the way that you want them to, or even the reasons for things that are awesome about their patch, right? Um, <clears throat> so do everything you can, in the, and think about the patch review as an opportunity to educate, again. Um, so, is that... I think this is a good place to go. Okay. <laughs> Right on. Okay, so um, so one of the new things that we deck. review for, yeah, it is a brand new slide deck, uh, sparkling new for uh, just for for down under. Anyway, so one of the things that we the one of the first things that we look for, of course, the uh, full frontal nicety is the most important. But one of the things that we look for when we're actually looking at the patch is um, does the patch actually you know work? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Um, now, obviously, the bot checks for that, but there are other things that we need to check for. You know, does it fix the issue? <clears throat> um, does it um, fix the issue and not fix other issues or not break other things? So are we staying uh, true to scope? A lot of times a patch will have, um, will, you know, it will fix something and then maybe an editor will automatically change white spaces or something strange like that, which is completely out of scope, even if it's wrong. <laughs> and white space is maybe a bad example because well, then we but it is a, it's actually a good example. That's why we have white space standards is because when white space it, it adds noise to the patch and it's it's very frustrating for you as a patch reviewer. It's very frustrating for the core committer when there's all these extra lines that have nothing to do with the change they're trying to review in the patch. So that's actually why we have coding standards to make sure that simple things like that are always consistent so they don't add extra stuff that's not relevant in the scope. Absolutely. And we, again, want to make sure that we don't introduce regressions. We, don't want, to make sure, we want to make sure that the patch doesn't break other things. <clears throat> we also check to make sure the patch makes sense. Um, is, is it readable? Do I understand what's going on? Do I understand, um, <clears throat> do I understand like the rationale of behind what's going on? Uh, are there enough comments? Have, is it documented well enough that I, uh, that even if a person is not familiar with the issue and they come in and they read the code directly? Because, I mean, when you go and look at the code, you're not, you know, there's not an issue number next to every line in the code, right? So if you're not familiar with the issue, does the code make sense? Can you understand it? Are there enough comments to do that? And also, um, I, this is a little bit dangerous, but I'll, is there a better way? Can we, can we do this more elegantly? Can we, um, can we do it with fewer lines of code and still be readable? Can we do it um, <clears throat> just better in any way? Can we reuse other APIs instead of creating new custom code? Yes. Things like that. Yeah, so, so we, we want to you know, kind of look and think about, is there a better way to, uh, to solve this problem? Um, but we, again, I, we have to keep in mind that when we're, when we're saying that there's a better way, if we do find a better way, that we, that we are also supporting improvement and not telling a person this is just wrong, right? This is, you've, your approach is horrible, or something like that, which um, actually happens. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, so we, we want to check that. So I, we should put like a there be dragon. Did I add that? You had that and it went away. Sorry. <laughs> or you could just put a picture of a dragon. Yeah. But, and, and this is actually something to keep in mind. If you think there's a better way, Pose it as a suggestion. I think maybe not. This is wrong. Do this. And yeah, exactly, exactly. Have you thought of doing it this way? And that way, that also gives you an opportunity to find out maybe your better way isn't better, or maybe there's a third person, uh, someone who has more experience, who can give you a suggestion on it. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about something that really sets core apart from the contrib space um, in terms of like the patch submission process, which is the core gates. Um, so this is, these are five gates. There's the usability gate, accessibility, documentation, performance, and testing. And each is sort of a checklist of the minimum standards we have for core in each of these specific areas. Um, they were first introduced at DrupalCon Chicago by Dries, so about two years ago now. And that was also right at the beginning of the Drupal 8 development cycle. So I would say that they've actually had a pretty profound impact on the way that Drupal 8 development has happened. Um, they've increased our velocity and they've made it so that we could scale to a lot more contributors. And right now, so 
Drupal 7 had a lot more core contributors than Drupal 6. I think we ended up with like a thousand people at the end of the release cycle. Drupal 8 is already like past that. So, and you know, it's still, it's not gonna be released for, you know, eight months a year. So, we wouldn't be able to, to keep growing the number of contributors without having these, these sets of things. Um, so, um, oh, and to get the specifics, this URL at the bottom of the screen, not too hard to remember, drupal.org slash core dash gates. I definitely recommend reading this page. It will have specific instructions in each of these specific areas about the, the things you really should know about, the things that you as a reviewer can check um, to make the, the patch review process more distributed and to make Drupal's quality higher. How it used to work is that, so there was like the usability team and the accessibility team and they were, they were the only ones who really like took responsibility for it and the gates distribute that responsibility out to all the other developers. And they also, they also make it so like, you know, maybe we don't need to focus on these really, really nitpicky things. Let's, let's focus first on the things that are most important to make core better. Yeah, but okay, so thank you. That, that is what I was going to do next. Um, so the first gate that we have up here is the documentation gate. And this is something that a lot of programmers in particular tend to overlook, but it's also very important. And if you've worked in, if you've worked with a number of other developers, you know it's important. And in Drupal, you're working with thousands and thousands of other developers, so it's even more important. Um, the first thing up here you might not be familiar with is um, issue summaries for core issues. Some of the points on this slide are things that you put in the code base in the patch itself. And other things are things that go on Drupal.org. And what the issue summary is, is the initial post when you first create a Drupal issue is actually editable now. So you can edit it like a wiki page and keep it updated so it always reflects what's currently going on in the issue. Someone posts a new patch, there's this problem with it. You put that in the summary. Someone looks at the patch and says, you know, actually, there's this really, really bad bug that we need to solve first. You put that in the summary and say, look at this other issue first and we'll postpone the second issue. And it's something, this is actually how I learned core is by writing issue summaries for issues. So it's actually a really, really great way to increase your own, like do your own professional development, increase your own skill set. And at the same time, you're providing a service to everyone else because if you take the time to, to fill out the issue summary and keep it up to date, you've just saved every other person who ever looks at that issue all the time that you took. So it's, it's really important and it is actually required for issues like a core maintainer can at any time say, okay, this issue is just too complicated. I need someone to write an issue summary for this issue before I will commit this patch. And, but we do recommend it for pretty much any issue, especially any issue that becomes long or complicated. So try it today. Go, go to an issue and click the edit tab and there's instructions there, it's great. Um, the second point up here, the second part of the documentation gate is the encode API documentation. So um, this includes the, the documentation blocks that are at the top of every function, every class, every constant. And there's a set of standards for them that are really, there's this huge document. It's one of the oldest nodes on Drupal.org. It's 1354. If you, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with that document, um, you'll look at it and then you'll wish you weren't familiar with that document. It's very long, it's very specific, but what the Core Gates page does is it summarizes the bare minimum things that we have to have in the patch in order for it to be accepted. So that's a really great place to start if you wanna learn how to document code. This is used on api.drupal.org. It's used by people's IDEs to describe what, what parameters are available for functions and so forth. Um, another part of the code base that's used in both those places, well, it's used on, on api.drupal.org, is the module.api.php file. Now, and this is the first example of something that's not relevant in every case. Um, you only need to make a change to the module.api.php for a module when there's a change to the hook. So if we add a new hook, if we remove a hook, we change its parameters, then that needs to be changed in that file and api.drupal.org uses that to document what the hook is. And the core gates page actually has an entire column that specifies specifically when is this necessary, when do you need to learn about it. So bookmark that page, put it on your, put it on your dashboard or something. On the fourth change, updating the hook.help, Again, this is only relevant when you need to, like when you add a new module, it needs a, a help hook. So that doesn't come into play too often. The last thing up here, um, and this is something that's again new in the Drupal 8 cycle, is change notifications. Every time we make an, a, an API change in the core code base, like we, we remove a function, we rename a function, we add a new API, we create one of these change notifications that are listed on that, this URL here, drupal.org slash list changes slash Drupal. That lists 
every single thing that's been changed in Drupal 8 in the past two years. So this, the goal of this is to make it easier for people when, they're, when they need to upgrade their contributed modules and their custom code on their, on their personal sites or their company sites. It, it actually helps them go through and figure out exactly what they need to change to go to the next version. Second gate, performance. For the performance gate is not what you think it is. So be sure to read the page for this. <laughs> so take an example. The second point up here, caches. Contrary to what you may think, caches are bad. But what the gate says for caches is only add a cache when you need it. Because cache invalidation is a really complicated problem. Caches make the developer experience more difficult. So an example, a patch that I'm going to show you in a little bit, um, this really, really big patch, this one thing in the patch made the Drupal.org front page 15 times slower. We added caching in that case. But in most cases, if you don't already know that there's a performance problem, you don't add that. And so there's a bunch of specific areas where you look for it. The performance gate isn't about saying, no, we don't make Drupal slower. It's about, let's document where the performance regressions are so that later in the release cycle, we can find a consistent way to fix them. Because premature optimization is, is bad in the performance world. Um, and, and just premature optimization, premature opti optimization is really bad. And, and the, th the key there is make sure that you, have, that you either profile it yourself or you have someone do that for you. And don't guess. Don't right. say, don't I think say, this will make it slower because Mark Sonnenbaum will come in here and he will, he will shake you and, and re-educate you. So. If, if, he, if he weren't actually presenting on this right now, he'd be in here shaking you already <laughs> just because you were thinking about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, what am I on? Next gate is the accessibility gate. Um, accessibility issues in Drupal are bugs. If someone can't use Drupal, it's a bug. Um, and the accessibility gate is really clearly documented. Additionally, all of these, most of these things up here have tools that you can use to test them. So you don't need to know anything about accessibility. Go read this page. You'll learn something about accessibility that you can then take and use on your own sites. Um, and then the usability gate is a, a bit more vaguely documented because usability, it turns out, is hard. It's hard to make sites easy. Who would have guessed? Um, the most important things for usability changes is like when something changes the user interface, acknowledge that it has an impact on usability or it may have an impact on usability. Um, so you tag the issue with usability and that gives people from the usability team an opportunity to look at it, give us feedback. And you should follow patterns that are already in core. Like maybe you want to invent a really cool new interface, but if you are inventing a really cool new interface, that needs to be documented in, in if it's the only thing like it in core, that makes core harder because people then have to learn two different patterns for how to navigate the site. And then finally, the, the simple part to understand of the usability gate is when you change the user interface, provide a screenshot, show what it looks like before, show what it looks like after. And then anyone can look at the issue and evaluate the change. All right, so this is the last gate, fifth gate. And this is probably the most important gate. And it's also my favorite, um, testing gate. So. I have notes over here. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss things. Um, I would say of these five areas, this is the part that has accelerated core development the most. Um, and it's also a really great way to get started as a core developer. Um, my first patch was an automated test. And I highly recommend that everyone in this room go to Lee's, Lee Rowland's um, automated testing session. It's tomorrow at 1 PM. I'm not sure what room it is in, but it's called uh, Show Me the Tests. And then there's a subtitle that's less clever. Um, but go to that session. It's, it's very it's, clever. It's just longer. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, I, didn't, I didn't remember it, so it, it was less memorable. But it, it's a really good session. I definitely recommend checking that out. You will learn a lot that you can take. If you're interested in review, reviewing tests, you, there's some fundamentals from testing that you'll want to learn first. Um, but Kuji Room, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Shannon. And that's where we are, so it's easy to remember. So no, this is Bronte. <laughs> so the first thing you have to do is check the test coverage and make sure the tests pass. We have a 100% test pass policy in core. That's stuff in your toes. Um, what this means is that we do, not put, we do not commit any patches to core that make the test suite not pass anymore. And once in a while, something slips by that causes intermittent failures or two patches that change similar things happen at the same time. And that's like an all hands on deck situation because it's extremely disruptive. So you 
as a reviewer, don't need to run the test because the bot does that for you. So keep in mind, all you have to do is look and say, hey, is it pink, is it green? If it's green, it passed, that's taken care of. However, the trickier part is checking the test coverage. So it could be that, like test bot's not magical, right? If there isn't already a test in the code base that says, make sure this thing happens when you click here, then if that thing doesn't happen when you click there, you won't know and the patch will still be green. So as a reviewer, you should check and make sure that whatever the patch changes already has coverage. Also make sure that the person who creates the patch isn't deleting a test. I've had the experience a few times where someone had a test that was failing. <laughs> Get rid of that. <laughs> and I mean, you know, because they, they didn't understand what was going on. There, there was a problem with the test or like they changed the test to assert a different result. And it's like, well, we, we, we kind of put that there for a reason. So if you see a little minus sign in front of a test line, stop and read the issue. Make sure that you understand why it's being changed and ask the person for feedback because always, always something to look at very carefully. And finally, um, not finally, add new tests for new features. And for bugs, upload a test case that fails. Sounds, doesn't really make sense. You want the test to fail. The idea is that when there's a bug in core, core tests have a 100% test pass policy, there's a discrepancy there because there's a bug, so something should be failing. So the first thing that someone should do is create a patch that only has the test in it. So when they upload that patch to the issue, that fails and it will show you exactly why it failed and hopefully explain, here's this bug. So then the person takes that patch, the test only patch, combines it with a bug fix, and then that second patch attached to the issue will pass, demonstrating that the fix that they have actually resolves the bug and the test that they have actually provides coverage for it. So this is, it's something that's difficult for people to get used to, but it's actually, if I don't see a test only patch and a combined patch, I can't review it. It's like, you know, please, you know, do this. And then I send them a screenshot of the pink stripe followed by the green stripe, which is my favorite thing in the world because it means that they understood the core gates. Um, provide a test module. Not everything can be tested with just within a test. Sometimes you need a test implementation of something if you add a new API there needs to be something in core that uses that API to provide coverage for it. Manually test. Not everything in, in Drupal is testable. The installer right now can't have automated tests. Um, JavaScript, there's work being done to add automated testing for JavaScript, but it's not possible in core right now. So if you have something that makes user interface changes, changes the installer, make sure to test that manually and provide screenshots when it's a front end change of what happens before and then what happens after. And then, um, Finally, I have up here, uh, this is something that's not actually on the Core Gates page, but it's something we've been discussing with the core maintainers and with, um, what's his name, Nod underscore, his name, I think his name is Theodor or Theodore. He's, he's the JavaScript maintainer for Core and Drupal 8. And so we've sort of agreed tentatively that um, until we have automated JavaScript testing, we want to document the manual testing steps that need to happen. So if there's a JavaScript bug, here's how you test to reproduce that bug. And so in the time being, that gives us like a template for the automated test that we will write in the future when that's testable. So it's not on the page yet, probably will be soon. And that's, um, again, go to this session, really. It's, it's the coolest thing ever. It totally is. <clears throat> so um, now just to recap a little bit, things that we look for, full frontal nicety, we look for, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry? Yeah, whether, does it actually work? Is it well documented? Did we look for the gates? We also want to look at coding style. Now, um, we, we touched on this a little bit before. Uh, the coding style, things like the two spaces that, um, you know, there's a period at the end of sentences that. Uh, spaces on the side that you have. Right, exactly. These kinds of things. We, we follow the uh, pair coding standards. Uh, in, in general, that's, um, and, and then we can, you can also find the, uh, the documentation on uh, our Doxygen, uh, which is the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the Doxygen, co Doxygen coding style Doxygen we use to generate the documentation that you see on api.drupal.org. So, there's so that number that I recited. There it is. 1354. 1354. Right, and you can find all of that information uh, there. So when we're reviewing a patch, we are reviewing for these things as well. Now, uh, some tools that you can use to, uh, to review patches. Uh, I, I think maybe my favorite is Dreaditor. 
and we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit more. You can also use your, your IDE. Uh, PHP lint, which is when you uh, type into your command line, you type php-l and then file name, and it will uh, just test and make sure that there are no syntax errors. Syntax for errors, exactly. I'm notorious <laughs> at like, I'll be like, oh, I'm going to fix this, and I'll accidentally type a comma instead of a semicolon. And so I've learned the hard way to type php-l on my code base before I upload that patch because I look like an idiot. Right, yeah. <laughs> I look like someone who should not be working on the kinds of problems I'm working on because I don't know that lines in PHP end in semicolons. She really doesn't look like that ever. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know, but when, when I upload patches like that, I feel like that, right? I think that all That's of us recognize it's, that, it's, you know, it's, yeah, 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 okay. So, which goes back to always encourage and, you know, okay, so anyway. Um, <clears throat> So PHP Lint, and then uh, there is also a tool called J JS Lint for JavaScript, and CSS Lint, and you can find those on the web. And there, are, there are tools that you can just feed the code through and see if it works. Does everything work in those code? I have no idea. Okay, there, there was a cleanup. I'm not there sure that works. everything yeah. works in JS Lint and CSS Lint, but just make sure that new yeah, actually, things um, do to review. There were, there were issues. Okay. It, it, did everyone hear that? JS Lint uh, complains about a semicolon with dribble behaviors. It's just, it exists. Um, and then the coder module, which uh, will, you know, review your code for coding standards and, and a lot of other awesomeness. Um, code sniffer and the grammar parser module are some other tools that you can use when you're reviewing um, patches and, uh, and need, like, maybe more information on, on the patch itself. And one thing that, <clears throat> that I would point out about the coding standards is that don't sweat it. <laughs> and if you see someone else screw up their white space, don't be a jerk about it. Um, because, you know, it's, it's something that ideally a machine should be able to fix these problems for you. And that's something we're working on, adding coded sa coding standards, testing on the bot, and so forth. All of those tools are something that eventually should be condensed into one thing on Drupal.org that just takes care of it for you and says, fix this and that. So. It's, it's way less important than everything we've talked about so far. It makes it difficult to read someone's patch if they have errors, but at the same time, it's not their goal. It's not to have perfectly formatted code. Their goal is to fix a problem. No, it's yours. Mine's oh, just the demo. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry. Um, so, so those are the things that we're looking for when, we are, when we're reviewing a patch. Um, what does that what does that translate to, into as far as the the review workflow? Um, but let's start before we actually start reviewing a patch and and, uh, and that sort of thing. We should we should maybe talk about a few little hints. The first thing you can't actually unread the issue. So if you're going to go in and you're going to review a patch, sometimes it makes sense to not read the issue and just read the patch and follow the workflow, and then go back and read the issue to see if it makes sense uh, with the actual complaint or the, uh, the bug report and those sorts of things. Also, perfect is the enemy of good and done sometimes. So if, if we go in there and we say, you know, this patch doesn't have the right spacing, and, and, we, and we go in and we nitpick things, and then eventually what happens is people just abandon patches, right? They, I, I've done it, I'm sorry, but I have. And, and we, we can't expect like complete perfection. In fact, there's someone in the room who has an extra uh, um, D.O user who instead of requiring people to make their patches perfect, will go in and fix the, the silly little things and then uh, upload a new patch. Which and is something you can do and you don't need to have a separate user account for it. It's right. just that if you're, <laughs> yes, right, and, and exactly. actually, and that's, a that's actually a legitimate con contribution to the issue, but um, someone in the room someone is in a, the little room. Bit, a little bit embarrassed by having more commit mentions than anyone else for cleaning up spelling and stuff, so didn't want that to happen. Right, don't yeah, someone that. in the room did that, and, and so that one would be uh, no commit credit. If you happen to see that, what that is, is that's just a silly little cleanup, and don't even worry about it. That someone shouldn't actually worry about it, because it's a relevant uh, helpfulness. That, that someone has like two-thirds of, of Tim's credits now, so plus the complaint. Right, okay, so anyway, and also. <laughs> 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 Okay, 
Anyway, so, and, and then to remember, also remember that everyone is different. That we, when we are going through and when Jess is demonstrating a, a patch review and, uh, and, and how Dreaditor works and, the, and those sorts of things, when, after you've reviewed a few patches, what will happen is you will, you will get your own process. It will be different and it won't be this exactly the same. We're trying to provide you with the tools and, the, and, and some kind of an idea of what to look for, but you should get, you know, hone your own process. <clears throat> All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to demo a tool called Dreaditor, um, written by a Drupal contributor named Sun. You've probably seen his name before, especially if you contribute patches to Drupal. Um, he's tall, he's German, and he's very cool. And he wrote this amazing JavaScript utility that basically it's like Drush is to Drupal, except for Drupal.org. So it takes Drupal.org and adds all kinds of functionality to it. And, and the major functionality that most people use is this little in-browser editing tool um, called, called Dreaditor. Um, and Drupal.org slash project slash Dreaditor. And I'm, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to demo a patch review using that tool, or at least, I mean, not the whole patch review process, but sort of what I do. Um, the patch that I'm using, incidentally, is uh, the largest patch I've reviewed in my career. It's 400K. Um, it converted the block system in Drupal 8 to use plugins. It's the biggest patch in the world, and it, it was epic, an epic process. So, and I, I spent a month of my life reading this. So, <laughs> this, by the way, is an example of why patches need to stay within a certain scope. Because if you end up with a 400k patch, not many people are crazy enough to spend a month of their life keeping and going back and reviewing it section by section. Anyway, it was a very important change, though. It's fundamental for the blocks and layouts initiative. The goal of which is eventually, maybe not in this release cycle, but in Drupal 9 or, or in Contrib and so forth, to make it so that core can do what panels does but better, essentially. So I'm going to switch now to our prearranged little. So here's an example. Oh, how do I make it? Show me. Is this the uh, command option X? Uh oh. Aha! OK, good. There we go. Oh, yeah. Can you switch it to mirror? Because I can't. <laughs> we didn't rehearse this part of the presentation in case you didn't notice. So system preferences, display. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. There we go. Yay. OK, and that's big. Not helping. OK. Yeah. I'm going to press the little button. Sorry. Da, 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 da. Oh, it's different. It's on the other side now. Why do you do that? Come on. Go. Yay. Yay. I can use a Mac. OK. So this is one of my 18 bazillion and five comments <laughs> posted on this issue. I'm not even looking at the right one anymore, so I'm going to hit Enter. Um, so this is one part of the patch review I did, is re review this new custom block module. Drupal 8 custom blocks that you create yourself are a separate module from blocks that are, con that are added from other modules. So this is an example of what a review post looks like. Um, and I'm getting, I'm getting a little silly in this post because I've been reviewing it for days. And so, but these, it, you, it allows you to paste these little code snippets with a comment about each one. So I'm going to show you what Dreaditor actually looks like. Um, here, up a little bit earlier in the issue, uh, Tim Plunkett re-rolled the blocks patch here. And Dreaditor, it's just a browser script that you install, gives me this little blue review button here. So I click this, and it opens this handy little browser. This patch is 400K. I mentioned that already, right? I, if I try to scroll and find things, it's not going to happen. Fortunately, on the left-hand side, there's a little browser here that shows me all the different functions and files that are changed. It's amazing. It also shows you the diff stat. Um, this patch changed 146 files, 5137 new lines, 3456 deleted lines. So it's a lot. So I'm going to scroll through the, in this side browser here to the custom block module. So it's under modules slash block slash custom block. There we go. Found it. Is this the previous one? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to go here, one of the first files in the custom block module. And so what I, what I did is I just basically read through the module and inspected all the different lines in the patch and looked for things that looked out of place. Um, you can see that it shows inserted lines in blue, deleted lines in red. Comments are green so that you can scan easily and see what's documentation versus functional code. 
And what you can do is you go through, and if you see something that seems out of place, like, I can't think of an example right now, but say that I, I, there was a problem with like this class name. This class name is not specific enough, or it's confusing. I double click on the line, and it opens up this little box on the side. So I would say, I would click. type on this laptop. So I, I would just put in a comment, say, oh, this isn't really a standard class name in this situation. And then I would insert a documentation link here, click Save, and then I would click Paste, and that actually inserts in the new comment on the issue five years from now, because the wired internet is broken and it's very slow. Well, we'll pretend just that you now see the markup. The oh, oh, yeah, that's good of you. No, so anyways, it, pa it pastes what okay. makes this. Now, I, I'll actually edit the comments and show you. Wait, do you have editing permissions on Dota? You do not. Okay, I can't do that either. Um, no, it's okay. I forgive you. Um, but yeah, it, it just inserts markup for code tags, and then your comments are after them. So that it's a really convenient tool, and um, it you know I just uh, what I do is I start from the bottom of the patch and read up, and then I might navigate around through that browser. What that does is it helps it so that it makes it so that I'm not just like reading a story. It helps me see things that don't make sense, and I read every single line starting from the bottom and going up. So that, that's how I go through reviewing patches. I'll, I'll make note of coding standards violations. I'll make note of things that are just like, that's really strange. So Dreader, it's a great tool. But you know, I mean, I don't know of anyone, I, I know of one person who does not use Dreader of, and reviews a ton of patches, um, but the majority of people who work in the core queue use Dreader and it's, it's, it's helped. So, Oh, they, we're out of order. We talked about scope. You know what scope is, right? I bet we're also mirroring now. All right. Sorry. It's a new sort of day. Did we mention that already? Do I need to mention that? Yep. And then you have to do the play and then the option after playing that. Oh, there we go. Excellent. <laughs> Sweet. <clears throat> okay, so. You know, to to review a little bit of, uh, of what just went on there, so that we can kind of uh, get bullet points on it. The first thing that we that we do when we're uh, it, when we open up Dreadeditor is we look for the most. Well, we we scroll down the issue, right? I, I didn't tell you there was an interdiff. So when you saw that patch, there was the patch, the green stripe. There was another file after that, <coughs> which Tim uploaded a a patch that only showed the difference between his patch and the previous one on the issue. So that's actually, if you reviewed the, reviewed the patch previously, start with that because it takes out all the noise and says, the only things that have changed since the last time I put time into this are these two lines. So, so, so we, we, uh, we look for the most recent patch and we do that by scrolling all the way to the bottom of the issue. In fact, in the issue that she reviewed, you can scroll all the way to the bottom, but then you have to scroll a little ways back up because there are so many follow-up issues to actually get to the most recent patch. But what we want to do is we want to look for the most recent patch and, and pop open Dreaditor on that one. Dreaditor provides you a handy little link to do that. Um, and then we'll, uh, while we're there, we're going to note if there are any um, tests-only patches or interdiffs, as we talked about before, where we want to make sure that a, a tests-only patch fails and then, um, and we need to make sure, again, uh, as she was saying about the, the interdifts, that if something has changed, then we only have to review part of it. We pop it open in, in Dreaditor. We can notice the diff stats and the modified files, which, uh, as you saw when she was uh, dem demonstrating those, that they were there. Um, <clears throat> we want to see which functions are changed. Oh, wait, I'm in the wrong place. There we go. Um, and, and then we also would like to check and make sure that there are tests. <clears throat> then, uh, <clears throat> then now we've scrolled down the diff. Now we're going to go back up. We uh, check the API documentation if there's anything that confuses us when we're going up. Yeah. Okay. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and we note any kind of code style issues, as we talked about before, the, un any unclear comments, and any other oddities about the patch. And then for each hunk, we say, okay, does this function make sense? Does this big part, uh, change make any sense? So, that, you know, a hunk may have, you know, several lines or, you know, only one or two lines, but does, does this make sense? Is it in scope? 
is it, is it documented as we're reading back down? And, and also, um, in addition to Dreader. In addition to Dreader, um, sometimes we also need to use it in the, uh, to, to actually apply the patch and review it in the IDE. Because what we need, what I need, uh, and I think I probably need it more often than, than Jess does, but maybe not, but, uh, or, your, or your editor. But because what I need to do is I need to see the code in context. I, I, I have to see, you know, okay, you've changed this, but what else was there? You know, what was there before? And, and it gives me handy color coding, which as a, uh, you know, person who likes colors, that's, you know, very cool. Pretty colors. Um, and, and in the IDA, I get step debugging for free. Well, for the price of the editor, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is that. Um, so yeah, does, uh, does that sum it up for everyone? Are there any questions? So that was, that was one of the points of that gate. I actually, the majority of patches that I review, I do not apply and test manually. Or I will do it once. Because once there's a test written for that, the test tells me what's supposed to happen. On that giant blocks patch, I tested the heck out of that manually. I spent so much time, went back and forth, and then I have this huge comment long with like, this is broken, and this is broken, and this is broken. But for small changes, or for changes that, um, that don't directly affect the front end, I don't test it manually. There are other people who can do that. Like, we actually have this, this core mentoring initiative that, we, that Andrea and I do, um, sort of distributes the workload. So I have a lot of experience in the core code base. I can just read code and say, this is what's going to happen. This is related to that. And there are people at this, that do it that are way better at it than me, too, that can just like read it and they, like, they execute Drupal in their brains. I swear, it's amazing. Or Daniel Vayner, the views call maintainer, unbelievable. I swear, he has all 500 files that are in views in his head. Um, but what I you know, I there's an opportunity when a patch does make a change that needs to be tested manually. Someone else can do that. All they have to be able to do is apply the patch and understand what the issue is about. So we try to break up the responsibility for it so that that gives them an opportunity to participate in the process, and it saves me time so I can go on and renew other patch. But you you do want to test it manually at least once, or make sure that someone else on the issue has. It's, it's a collaborative effort, right? You're not responsible for everything. You're just helping review the patch. And then it, it goes to the committer too. And if you get Angie as your committer, she'll test the patch manually too. You should, I mean, you should test it before she does, but. <laughs> and um, I actually, uh, I, I do like to at least test the patch once myself, manually test it. Uh, be, because it also gives me, again, that context that I was, that I was talking about before where mm -hmm. I want to see where it is in, in the code, but I also want to see where it is in the UI and, and how, and within the behavior of, of, the, of the site or the, Anyway, you get what I mean. Any more questions? Anyone else? Someone else? One more, more. Yeah. You mentioned in the, in the write up um, you talk about patches that sometimes get done as soon as it's possible. Right. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And we, and we talked about that briefly uh, earlier, too, where, where I was saying that, that a lot of times, especially new contributors, where someone will come in and be discouraging and or uh, not provide very much uh, guidance on how to how to fix it or how to make it better, and so then you know things just they they just go or and not they getting down. feedback at all is very right. It's, it is right. very discouraging. But it never goes anywhere. Right. Right. That's there. There are things you can do about it. There, there are things. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are things you can do, and this is an excellent session to have attended because one of the things that, that I would encourage you to do is do a, a, a patch review exchange. So find someone else that's working in, in core or in the, in the contrib module that you're, you're looking for and say, I'll review your module if you review mine. So that then we have, uh, you know, someone who's reviewing, and then also we're we're working with uh, with core mentoring to uh, try to try to alleviate some of that problem. And obviously, the more Drupal grows, the harder that gets. Oh, right. Yeah. The, I guess the the big difference about core is that, um, in and the reason I like working on core is in contrib there might only be that one person, and if they're not available, um, you know. What can you do? In core, there's a, the patch might say it needs review for a long time, but once it gets to RTBC, a core committer is going to look at it. So that, that's one of the reasons I, I prefer working in core in general, and that's one of the reasons like contrib modules are not very well maintained anymore, so I'm that person for a module you can find on my Drupal.org profile that a lot of sites use. Oops. Um, 
But another thing to keep in mind is that we're, we're starting to try to solve the problem, but it, there's still a lot, of, a lot of patches out there that just sit. The first thing to do, all those gates that we mentioned, make sure your patch meets those gates. Log on to IRC, join the Drupal Contribute channel. If you're not in there, use it. Anytime you're trying to d contribute something to Drupal, whether it's documentation, whether it's a contributed module, whether it's a fix for core, you can ask the ch question in that channel, and you get to talk to all the smart people. Like, Angie's in that web chick is in that channel all the time. I mean, she lives on IRC. I I'm, I'm on pretty much constantly, although not during the conference. Andrea's on a ton of the time. So you get a chance to talk to people who have a lot of experience, talk to the core maintainers, and like, find out, okay, so I have this patch that makes changes to the entity system. Who's a good person to talk to about that? You, you might start by looking at maintainers.txt and saying, oh, Fago's the maintainer for that subsystem. I'll try to ask him. He's never on IRC. You don't know how to contact him. You log, on, you log in IRC and say, oh, hey, does someone know a lot about the entity system? And say, hey, talk to Bear Deer. Bear Deer knows a lot about the entity system. He's going to be a co-maintainer too. And so then you get that information about who to contact specifically that might give you feedback because it's, it's their little subdomain of core. Also, uh, another uh, very key thing to getting your patch reviewed is to make sure that the issue summary is up to date yes. and well yes. um, and verbose. You use your most verbose mode on, on the issue summary. Well. Well, okay, you're almost <laughs> most verbose. Depends moment. on who you are. <laughs> I, I can get really verbose sometimes, sorry. But anyway, um, but, you, but if, the, if the issue summary is not clear or doesn't make any sense or any of those things. Or not then, current. Even or if, not current. If it's, it reflects the patch as of October, mm -hmm. that doesn't help me if you've changed it since then. So. Right, and, and what, what, then what ends up happening is I go in and I, I scan through the issue summary and I'm like, wait, I don't understand, and then I get distracted, and this is who I am. I'm a, I'm a you know, jump around. So, but if it makes sense and I can, I can kind of get in the zone and I can, I can do a review. But if, it, if it's something that I have to work at in order to understand what's going on, then uh, I will, I'm sorry. It, it, it is what it is. I'll get distracted and I will move along. And, and it may be days, weeks, never before I get back to it. I'm sorry? Exactly. Yeah. And I've left comments like that because it's, you know, I, I could spend a bunch of my time doing research and that's actually a way, if, it, if it's not a patch that you're working on but that you're interested in and the person who originally posted the patch is missing, then you, if you do take the time to do the research and write that summary, that makes it easier, even though the person who originally wrote the patch has abandoned it, that makes it easier for the patch to get in because then, yeah, someone else can look at it and, and all of a sudden people say, oh, hey, I have this problem too and now I actually understand that this is the thing that's supposed to fix it. Right. And, and you can also, um, try not to take advantage of this, but you can also uh, ping Jessarai in, in IRC. And we'll tell you what to do next. Yeah. Like we have this workflow <clears throat> in our minds of like, this is the, what I would do if I had that difficulty getting a review. Exactly, and, and we can also throw new contributors at it sometimes if it's something that, that makes sense to have a new contributor, you know, fix the issue summary or review yep. or any of those kinds of things. Make friends at CodeSprint. Yes, yes, absolutely, make lots of friends at CodeSprint. Which friends. is a great segue, we should probably go to the slide. Right, yes, so okay. We're at the end of the time for our session now. Um, and, but I'll, I'll hang around a little bit afterwards yeah. if you want to come and ask questions. We have a break afterwards, so if anyone has any other more specific questions, we're here. So, yeah. So some things that we, we can do next is uh, definitely come on Saturday for our Code Sprints. Uh, they will ha they'll start at 9 a.m. Addie's going to be here, and she's going to do some awesome uh, a community tools workshop, which will be from 9 a.m. until everybody is amazing and awesome with their, their setup, or 1 p.m., whichever comes first. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then we'll be doing the mentoring sprint all day. I'll be uh, handling that. Uh, and there will also be a big kid sprint in uh, the upstairs. upstairs oh, well, uh, it, it was a, I don't actually know where they're going to be. I, I keep saying upstairs because the past two events had downstairs was was where the, the core mentoring sprint was and upstairs was where the... In a different room. Core sprints, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. Is but so, so, did we explain? I don't think... Did the, what the core mentoring sprint is, is so... Yeah, we didn't say that. Um, basically, you come and we explain a little bit about the, our core mentoring initiative and say, hey, we have all these tasks that need to be done in the core queue. Want to give it a shot? And then you work with someone else and we'll help you through the process of working on a patch. And if you want to do this for a patch review, that's awesome. 
Um, we can help you, mentor you through like, oh, this is what I would do to review the patch, or say, you know what, I wouldn't start with that one. Like, that actually can be a really helpful thing because when you're first getting involved, you don't know what's difficult and scary versus what's straightforward, and someone can give you that advice. And then that, that also, so what the, that sprint came out of is actually, I do this, this core mentoring thing in IRC. Andrea is one of the facilitators for it. Um, I'm a facilitator for it. We have about eight people. And twice a week, um, I have, actually, there's, there's three different times a week. Um, the second time is for wind sprints, which Andrea leads by herself. But in, in this time zone in Sydney, it's 1 p.m. on Tuesday, and um, Lee Rowland is, he, he lives here in Australia, so he's a mentor, um, so he's not like falling asleep because it's late at night for him. And then 9.30 p.m. on Friday, um, you'd get Andrea, and she would have just woken up because she, we live in the States. Um, is it really 9.30? I did a 30. I, that's what your little thingy said. Okay. But if she's not there at 9.30, she'll be there. I mean, she'll be there for, two, it's a two-hour block. So yeah. she'll be there even if that's not exactly when it starts. Um, yeah, and we do the same, th so it's the same thing, but over IRC. You come, you say, hey, I want to do core mentoring. We give you a task. You try it. You can ask us questions. We're there for the whole two hours, and then we'll try to give you feedback on it. And there's a website we use to track it. It's cool. And then, like I said, anytime, Drupal-contribute on IRC. That channel is the place to go. And the coders launch here. There, there were not that many people here now, but yes, we have more people. That, that's probably what? Excellent. And conferences are a great chance to meet people who have ideas. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you want me to put it back? No, that's fine. We're done. Okay. Are we done? <laughs> All right. So, so does it, anyone else have questions, or should we just like we, turn the microphone? We, yeah, we should probably let people yeah. not feel bad for leaving because it is <laughs> snack time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want the penguins. Oh, I see. <laughs> Someone did notice the penguins. The penguins are Andrea's obsessive, and she wanted to have three by three, and we only had eight thank yous. I mean, I, I, we could I think, killed the we joke. Could, I'm sorry. We, we could think of dozens of people to put in there, but, but it was It would like, be like a collage of names overlapping, and you wouldn't be able to read anything. That would have, yeah. I, I got to pet a koala. That was like the highlight of my trip. Yeah. Aside from this. Right. <laughs> right. Second, second best part. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, wait, 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 one more thing. Oh. Don't forget to go and uh, review our session at, you know, all this stuff. Program tested schedule, there is a link at the top. It's a survey it's a form. Thursday. It'll go to SurveyMonkey, and you will, you know, tell everybody how awesome we are. Unless they fix the link, it's really hard to see. It's in the block of text that's before. They did fix it. Yeah. It's, it's in bullets now. Um, I mean, it's not. Right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye.